Hello everybody, this is Mike Cooper at Calvary Chapel Dipau. In this session we're going to be uh, studying Proverbs 28 verses 1 through 7. And I've titled my message uh, this evening as Living in the Light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, just to thank you for this time that we can come together, Lord, even online, Lord, that we can study your word together and that you'll just come and be with us tonight, Lord. Walk among us here, no matter where we are, Lord, and touch our hearts. Help us to discover you, Lord, and new things about you. Teach us your wisdom and give us understanding for your word, Lord in everything that we do and we pray this in jesus name amen okay proverbs 28 verses 1 through 7 28 1 the wicked flee though no one pursues but the righteous are as bold as a lion this speaks of the continual confusion and fear that properly belongs to the wicked but not to the godly and wise it implies that the wicked, wicked, prompted by a guilty conscience or fear of judgment, become fearful and suspicious of everyone. Guilt in the conscience makes men a terror to themselves, looking around every corner to see if someone is looking after them. It's like a person that owes money and is always looking for the debt collector. Though they pretend to be easy, there are secret fears that haunt them wherever they go. In Psalms 53, 5, it says, But there they are, overwhelmed with dread, while there is nothing to dread. Matthew Henry says, Those that have made God their enemy and know it cannot but see the whole creation at war with them, and therefore can have no true enjoyment of themselves, no confidence, no courage, but a fearful looking for, for judgment. Sin makes men cowards. You know, the first example of this was in the Garden of Eden. That's when Adam sinned against the Lord. He acted wickedly, believing the servant or the serpent instead of God his Father. Then in Genesis 3 8, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. God wasn't stalking them. He was just walking. He wasn't pursuing them. He was just there, if he, as he often was, for the good of his people. But things were different now. Adam and Eve had now had, had, now had bad consciences. And a bad conscience makes breezes into burglars and shadows into ghosts and police into adversaries and parents into police and God into an enemy, even when they're not. So while they were hiding in the trees, the Lord called out and asked, Where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Adam had never before had to flee from the arrival of God. Now he flees when no one is pursuing. Why is that? Because his conscience condemns him, and he hears this condemnation in every breeze that blows, and every creak of the door, and every whistle on a soccer field. He sees it in every shadow and every flashing light on a police vehicle, and he feels it in the presence of God. I had a brother like this. He was always afraid, no matter where he went, because he thought he might get stopped by the cops. I loved him, and I felt for his fear, but there wasn't anything I could do for him except pray. He fled the state of California and tried to get lost in the state of Arizona because they didn't know him there. He tragically died of drowning in a lake while he was on the run. I don't know what his status was with God when he died, but I can only hope. What this verse is teaching us is that you and I have a conscience given by God and that our conscience is committing to getting our, con our accounts settled, to making things right when we have done something wrong. In fact, this conscience is so committed to not let us rest with the unrectified wrong that it, it will create pursuers out of nothing. 
Our guilty conscience will turn shadows into phantoms and ambulances into police cars and innocent inquiries into indictments and doorbells into threats and mailmen into warrant officers, school teachers into wardens, and parents or spouses into cross-examiners, and friends into traitors, and simple office mem memos into termination papers. What a life. A guilty conscience will create pursuers out of anything unless we drown it with alcohol, or numb it with drugs, or silence it with blasts of music, and flights from quiet solitude, or harden it with constant denials. The wicked are people who will not make right what they have done wrong, nor set their face to do good. And while the grace of God persists to anyone in need, they flee, even when no one pursues. But the righteous, it says here, are different in this, ver in this verse. They are bold as a lion. Who are the righteous here? In Psalm 32, 1 and 2, David says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. How blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, whose sins are covered. And at the end of the psalm in verses 10 through 11, it says, Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous sing, all you who are upright in heart. These are the forgiven. The righteous ones are the ones who trust in the Lord, the ones who have faith and bank their hope in the mercy and power of the wisdom of God. These are the ones to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and whose sins are forgiven. They are righteous, not with righteousness of their own, but with the imputed righteousness of God. These are the ones who are free from fear. Their consciences are sprinkled clean from evil conscience. And it's said in Hebrews 10, 22, their hearts do not condemn them. In 1 John 3, 21, they are right with God because of his grace and not because of their merit. And their boldness with God and with men show the worth and value of their gospel. And in Hebrews 4, 2 and 6, of God's grace. So it's a matter of seeking God's grace when we fail. And to seek forgiveness and turn away from sin. It's as simple as that. Then our consciousness won't bother us. And then in verse 2, it says, when a country is rebellious... It has many rulers, but a ruler with discernment and knowledge maintains order. In the King James Version, it says here, For the transgression of a land, many are, of, many are the princes thereof. But by the man of understanding and knowledge, the state thereof shall be prolonged. This is talking about our leaders. The, the transgression of the land brings in many princes, it says. Transgression here means a breach of trust or rebellion. Since we are reading the Bible here, we need to grasp that the rebellious or the rebellion spoken of is that which is against God. When a nation is rebelling against God, trouble is brewing. Many would think here that since it's in, in the Bible, it's talking about Israel. But that isn't what, you know, it's not saying that. It says transgression of a land. We also have to remember that God is sovereign. It all belongs to him. So when it says that when a country is rebellious or transgressing, transgressing, yeah, that it has many rulers. Why is that? As a sovereign God, he holds all nations to his moral law. When a nation rejects him and his moral law, a measure of chaos results which grows over time. If a nation continues on its path of rejecting God and his ways, then soon there will be rumblings of the coming moral and political earthquake that will hit society and hit it strongly. 
It's been happening in countries all over the world in various ways. Since I am an American, I will personally state that I strongly believe that it's true of the United States. And it has been, it's been having its effect on our country since the early 1900s. I don't want to go into a lot of specifics about my country because that isn't what this is about. It's about God's word and what it says about any country that falls with God's, that fails with God's moral values. I'll let you decide how your country is doing. The many princes spoken of in this verse doesn't refer to any particular type of government. It refers to the problem of coups and overthrows. It speaks of those that are up, usurper, a supreme power. Usurp means to take legally or by force. When a land or country begins having a total disregard for the Lord and His law, they will also have no regard for any law. As we grow to reject God and reject law in general, people will turn to whatever right is in, right is in their eyes as they did in the book of Judges. Whatever is right in their eyes, in other words, is what they say is right. It also tells us in this verse of how to have a nation endure. It endures by having a man of understanding and knowledge around. The two words used here are vital to us in grasping what God is saying here. Understanding is the Hebrew word bin, B-I-N. And it means to be discerning, to be able to perceive, to pay attention to things. Having the ability to apply God's wisdom to any situation in life. The second word, knowledge, is a Hebrew word, yada, and it means to know. And here it refers to the ability to discriminate between what is right or wrong, good or bad. It also has the idea along with it of knowing what to do which in this case refers to what God desires that the nation do. Consider these two words. The overt reference to God's wisdom in the current way God is viewed by its elected leaders. Do you see much of a chance for nations with leaders who reject God and who are rejecting any kind of accountability to the laws already on the books of the nation to endure? When this happens, the people look for another prince, and so on and so on, until they find a righteous leader. And then in verse 3, it says, A ruler oppresses the poor. Who oppresses the poor is like a driving rain that leaves no crops. Oppressing the poor is pretty straightforward, isn't it? If someone who is poor oppresses someone else who is poor, like a hard rain, he's a big drip. He's all wet. Certainly the poor should have compassion upon the poor. We are poor in spirit. We realize that the poverty, the inadequacy of our own lives. Therefore, we should be compassionate and forgiving of the problems, mistakes, and weaknesses of others. And speaking of the poor in spirit, in Matthew 5, 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are not those who are spiritually poor or lacking in faith or love, but those have a humble spirit and they depend on God. In Luke 6.20 it says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. God has chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to possess the kingdom. In Matthew 18, we read of a king who forgave the debt of a man who owed him an equivalent of $10 million. But once exonerated, the man found a person who owed him the equivalent of $2,000, and he demanded full payment. When the king heard about this, he said to the man he had forgiven, You will be cast into prison until you pay the full $10 million, because... Although I forgave you much, you wouldn't forgive another man a little. We have no right to hold anything against anyone else because we've been forgiven for so much. So if I oppress others, come down on others, heap condemnation on others, 
I'm like the poor oppressing, poor oppressing the poor, and I'm all wet. I'm hit by a driving rain. It means that I don't possess the principles necessary for a good leader. It means that my character is flawed and I have no business leading others. What, what does it mean to have good character? What makes a man of good character? It talks of a man with good character when speaking of an elder in Titus 1 verses 6 to 8, where it says an elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing honest, dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. That's a man with character. So the single, overarching qualification of which the rest are supported is that he is to be above reproach. That is, he must be a leader who cannot be accused of anything sinful because he has sustained a reputation for blamelessness. An elder is to be above reproach in his marital life, his social life, his business life, and his spiritual life. In this way, is he, he is to be a model of godliness so he can legitimately call the congregation to follow his example. All of the other qualifications, except perhaps, perhaps teaching and management skills, only amplify that idea. In Philippians 3.17 it says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Above all, he must be an example to others, truthful, honest, loving, with empathy, a model of godliness and goodness in his heart. How are, how are politicians holding up to this? Are they making it? Do they make the grade? This is the type of leader we should be looking toward, not just in the church, but in the nation. As a nation, if we lose our sense of these things, the importance of leadership for the nation, then we are in danger of a torrent that will destroy the nation and leave it without, without good guidance and empathy for others in need. A nation can only stand on the character of its leadership. Godly leadership is the key to prosperity. In Proverbs 14, 34, it says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. You know, this proverb isn't the target of any particular nation, but its meaning applies to all nations. So it's important for all of us to measure ourselves, especially in these challenging times. We should be asking ourselves which of these two causes we should embrace, whether righteousness or sin. Any nation, no matter where they are birthed, or mythos or origin, or how many blood-stained battlefields for righteous causes, rises or falls by who it is today. If a nation has a righteous leader, what is bound to happen? There should be prosperity and blessings. If not, then that nation is in for hard times. In verse 4 it says, Those who forsake instruction praise the wicked, but those who heed it resist them. To forsake means to abandon, to no longer have anything to do with. To heed means to listen and obey. Praising the wicked in this verse is telling us of who those that forsake instruction turn to, the wicked. If you praise the wicked, you turn to the wicked. It is also saying to heed instruction 
and to resist the wicked. In the King James or New King James Version, it says, Those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. So the law in its verse translated from the Hebrew Torah, which means either the Mosaic law or the teachings of the wise, is also speaking to morality. Those who strive against them or contend with them are those who keep the law. In other words, those who obey God's law struggle against evil people or always oppose them. Are we opposing evil people or our evil leaders if we have them? In Ephesians 5, 11 through 14, <clears throat> excuse me, it says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it, is said, it says, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So we are, are to expose them for the shameful, shameful things that cannot be mentioned. And they are disobedient to God and do these unmentionable things in secret. Many of us can relate to that, whether you've been a Christian for most of your life or not. This stands for our leaders. Do we support a wicked leader because he promises to be righteous? The very fact that he is wicked tells us that we should have nothing to do with him in the first place. We are to expose the fruitless deeds of darkness. To most of us, that, uh, that was the old life, what we used to be. It is what we lived in before we were saved by the blood of the Lamb. The old life was the darkness and essentially unfruitful. In the sight of God, it was a matter of fruit or no fruit. The darkness and the endless and strenuous but futile human striving. But it should instead be the natural development from the life that God provides within us that leads to an outward manifestation and ways that are a blessing to all. It's called bearing fruit. That comes from Galatians 16, 16 through 26. And I want to read that to you because it's important to this verse. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, this is what we're talking about, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. The works of darkness are unfruitful, and therefore worth nothing. We are not to be involved in that, and we are to expose it. They are the disobedient, and there is no light in them. In John 3.20 it says, Everyone who does evil hates the light, 
for fear that their, de their deeds will be exposed. These verses aren't speaking of salvation. They're exposing the wicked, comparing it to the good. It is speaking to corruption and condemnation. As it says in Romans 6.21, What benefit did you reap at the time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. We always hope for the redeeming sanctification of Christ, but this is speaking to those who have no light in them. And this also speaks to the proverb, to the next proverb. In verse 5, evil doers do not understand what is right, but those who seek the Lord understand it fully. In Isaiah 44, 18, it says, they know nothing. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see, and their minds closed so they cannot understand. The Apostle John quotes Isaiah in 12, 39 through 40. For this reason they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. John is presenting the ultimate reason for people's reaction to God's messengers as God's own actions of blinding their spiritual eyes and hardening their hearts. He purposely does it. It's important that this truth is balanced by the fact that people so blind and hearted had also made their own choice to reject the message and for their own reasons. So they don't understand what is right. But part B here, it says of the verse, it says, those who seek the Lord understand it fully. Proverbs 2, 9, then you will understand what is right and just and fair, every good path. In James 1, 5, it says, any of you who lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. In 1 John 2, 20, it says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all you know, and all of you know the truth. So in Proverbs 2, 9, it tells us that we'll be led down straight paths. And James 1, 5 tells us of where to get the wisdom needed for the understanding. And in 1 John 2, 20, tells us of who we are and that we know the truth. Who is with us? The Holy Spirit. We know because it is in God's word that we are to seek it constantly. It gives us the understanding and wisdom needed to transverse this road, this world, and stay on straight paths. This allows us to bring joy into the world and to others' lives as we cross paths with them. It gives us the confidence to know that we have the truth within us and that there is no argument against it. There cannot be. As Christians, we're secure in His Word and His loving grace to tell others of the truth that everyone needs to hear. We fully understand, as the verse says, we belong to the light and He lives within us. In 1 John 2.27 it says, As for you, the anointing you receive from Him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has been taught to you, remain in him. Don't walk away. This is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in 14, uh, John 14, 16, that the Holy Spirit, once giving, will remain with us forever. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. These verses tell us that the competence of the Holy Spirit teaches us. His anointing teaches us about all things. And it teaches us that it is the truth. 
The implication here is that we have the Holy Spirit living within us and that the truth lives within us. So we continue in the truth. Therefore, we have understanding. Praise God. And then in verse 6, it says, Better the poor whose walk is blameless than the rich whose ways are perverse. Blameless or righteous means to walk with integrity. Integrity means firm adherence to the code of especially moral values. An unimpaired condition or soundness, the quality of being complete or undivided. So a person with integrity knows what he knows what he knows. He is not going to cross that line. This is a righteous man, a godly man. Proverbs 16, 8 says, Better a little with righteousness than much with injustice. Proverbs 16, 19 says, Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. And then is comparing this to the perverse rich man. I want to say right now that all rich men are not perverse, just like all poor, poor men are not righteous. These terms are used for the purposes of the proverb to give an example between integrity or righteousness and perversity. Perverse means turn away from what is right or good, turned away from or corrupt or depraved. So when it talks about these two words in a walk, it is referring to a way of life. In Romans 2, 6 through 11, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and mortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first to the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. In Romans 2, the Jews thought of themselves as a holy people. They thought that they were uh, entitled to privileges just for the right of being a Jew. The truth was that they were unthankful, rebellious, and unrighteous. Their ways were perverse. The judgment of God will be according to their real character. That's not for all of us. In every willful sin, there is contempt for the goodness of God. And even though the branches of man's disobedience are various, all spring from the same root. But in true repentance, there must be hatred for former uh, sinfulness. There is a change in the state of the mind which guides us to choose the good and refuse the evil. It shows a sense of inward wretchedness. A change like this is brought about through repentance, a conversion, and it's needed for every human being. The ruin of sinners is their walking with a, with a hard and impenitent heart. So the verses are saying they are treasuring up wrath and anger. For the just man in these verses that are doing good, they will have eternal life. Their motives are pure. And they reject the actions which are earthly and ambitious. In all the descriptions of the righteous, contention is held forth as the principle of all evil. The human will is in a state of enmity against God, even the Gentiles like you and me. They didn't have the written law, but in reality they had it within sinful man and it directed them to do evil just by the light of its nature listen beloved conscience is a witness pay attention to it 
Nothing speaks more terror to sinners and more comfort to saints than the fact that Christ will be the judge. Secret services in serving the Lord shall be rewarded, while secret sins shall be punished and brought to light. And then in verse 7, it says, A discerning son heeds instruction, but a companion of gluttons disgraces his father. Discerning here means to be able to see and understand. Heeds means to listen and take action. This gives the connotation that the parents of his son have taught him to be able to understand and take action about anything that he may come up against. In Proverbs 23, 19 through 21, it says, Listen, my son, and be wise, and set your heart on the right path. Do not join those who drink too much wine or gorge themselves on meat, for drunkards and glut gluttons become poor, and drowsiness clothes them, clothes them in rags. So we have to be able to see what is right and wrong, and then to hang out with the right kind of people. If we don't follow these instructions, we disgrace our parents. In Luke 21 through 34, it says, Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. I know about that. It's, it's caught me in its trap in the past. This verse is telling us to take heed to ourselves, that we don't become overpowered by temptations or betrayed by our own corruptions. It is speaking of our heart that will be weighed down and will be fallen into a trap. In Romans 13, 13, it says, Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissensions and jealousy. Paul exhorts us to walk right and in broad daylight. The Greek word for walk here is peripateo. It literally means to walk around. Because in this verse it is telling us to behave decently, it is telling us of how to live our lives in Christ. Your walk is the external behavior that other people say, or the other people see. You might be thinking, it doesn't matter what other people see or think, and I know my heart is right with God. But it does matter what they say, and the conclusions that they draw about Christ and Christianity based on the way that you live. You have to be an example. I saw a sign once on a dry cleaning agency that said, let us walk properly. If your clothes aren't becoming on you, they should be coming to us. <laughs> That's a clever advertisement. During the day, do you like the way that you look? When the full strength of broad daylight is shining on you, when there are no dark shadows to hide or cover your circumstances, can you have your life in full view for all to see? Are you lying beyond reproach, or are you living beyond reproach? Does the soon appearance of Jesus Christ have any effect on the way you're living right now? When I became a Christian, there were certain things, certain sins that I knew I had to turn away from forever. Paul is telling the Romans here, you need to stop these things immediately and do not do them again. Things like rioting, the Roman party, girls gone wild, guys gone goofy, sins like drunkenness, wantonness, strife and envy. People in Paul's day had parties, drunkenness. All I want to do is have some sun, some fun, I have a feeling I'm not the only one. The same song has been sung for a thousand years. I just want to have a good time. 
Christian God is calling you to be the best time, to be in the best time. In order to pursue love, you must set aside the harmful pursuits of personal pleasures. Do you want to love people like Christ loves them? Tell them there are certain things that you have to get rid of in your lives. The evil that Paul talks about is in these verses, self-indulgence, sexual immorality, lust, and envy of the exact reasons that there is too little love in the Christian church today. In Romans 13, 14, it says, Rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul was talking about putting on spiritual clothing. Those who close themselves with the Lord Jesus are believers who do not focus on gratifying desires of the sinful nature. This could be a whole sermon itself. But in our context and this message, this message, it means that we are walking in His image and blessing others along the way of life. It is a, a lifetime blessing and life for all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that you'll help us live these words that we've heard tonight, Lord, to live in righteousness and follow you in all things, Lord, to be upright, to be doing the right things at all the times, Lord, to be an example of you and what you've done in our lives, Lord, so, so people will see that and turn to you, that you can use us in that way, Lord, to bring people to you so they can live in eternity with you, Lord, rather than the other. Use us, Lord, to bring people to you in that way, to help us be uprighteous in heart, Lord, and to be living in the Spirit and to and to just be following you in all the things that we do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, beloved.